Good morning, folks. Welcome to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and we're in luck because we're at the K-State Olathe Horticulture Research and Extension Center. And we also have Dr. Kerry Rivard, who is the director of the center, and he's also the research and extension specialist here at the station. He's going to be talking to us about basically urban farming. So I want you to grab your cup of coffee and come on back. We'll start the show. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Good morning, folks. Welcome to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and we're in luck because we're at the K-State Olathe Horticulture Research and Extension Center, which is on the corner of Johnson, Miami, and uh, Douglas County. So we're, we're, we're getting almost three counties here. And with us, we have our fruit and vegetable guy, Dr. Kerry Rivard. And Kerry, thanks for joining us this morning. And our, our, our viewers are, are a lot of producers, okay? And, and we're, we're thinking mainly uh, row crop and wheat and that sort of thing, and, and not so much uh, what, the, what the horticulture center here does. So I'm, I'm glad you're with us this morning. So kind of tell us the, the history of this center and, and what you got going. Sure. So this center is a little bit different than most of the big ag experiment stations around the state. It was built in 1996 is when it was first established. And it was actually, the land was donated from the army. We're on a old army ammunition plant. Right, I remember that. And the property that we're actually standing on here never had any kind of munitions productions. It was what they called a buffer zone, where essentially they didn't want any debris to land on somebody's house. So they owned the land, um, but didn't build anything here. Uh, but long story short, they uh, donated the land to K-State to us in about 1996, and we have about 342 acres here. Uh, now we really intensively manage about 80 to 100 of that. There's also a couple hundred acres on the other side of the creek that aren't very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we do uh, research and extension with all horticultural crops, um, so mainly focused on fruit and vegetables, uh, turf, and also floriculture. So the Prairie Star uh, Floriculture Program is located here. Uh, we, have, we do a lot of work with our turf specialists. It's located in Manhattan. Uh, and then I help run the fruit and vegetable uh, component of the, the station. Okay. This is a really interesting, interesting site. Now, do you have a, a lot of producers? These would be urban producers, basically. Do you have a lot of urban producers come to the, come to the center here? We do, and we also have a lot of rural producers as well. Uh, for example, we had our commercial vegetable field day here just the other night, and we had people represented from all parts of Kansas. So people, especially those that are, that are looking for specific information about those topics, they'll travel from all parts of the state to come here. Okay. So also related to extension, uh, we have master gardeners. Of course, yeah, and the master gardeners are very involved here at the research station, uh, both here in the extension uh, master gardener backyard garden, but also volunteering on the farm as well. So Johnson County has a very strong master gardener program. Uh, I think there's over 500 master gardeners in the, in the county right now, and something like uh, 11 or 12 demonstration sites. So and this, this is one of the this, demonstration yep, sites. This behind us is, is what we call the backyard demonstration garden. Um, and it's, it's a mixture of both vegetables and flowers, but um, this site in particular is really well known to have a strong emphasis on food production. Um, and we have a great group of volunteers. There's about 55 master gardeners that are assigned to this area, and they show up every Wednesday, and they get more work done in two hours than the rest of well, us can do in two weeks. Them. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't You're hurt. only four or five people. Well, there. you know, we're a little bit out in the country here, so the master gardeners that come here, they're kind of what we call the hardcore ones. They're willing to come all the way out here and, and visit us, uh, and they're some of the hardest workers I've seen. They do some really creative and innovative things. Well, this is just a beautiful demonstration garden. I mean, it's just wonderful. <laughs> Folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Soil is the life of a farm. And for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence 
excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. Come. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and we're still at the Kansas State Olathe Horticulture Research and, Ex and Extension Center, and we have Kerry Rivard, Dr. Rivard. He is our fruit and vegetable guy over here at Olathe Station. And, uh, we're under a high tunnel here, and we've got some interesting things here. You don't normally see this late in the season. No, not at all. It's very unusual to see strawberries this time of year, absolutely. So tell me what we have here. So what this is, this is an experiment looking at the production of day-neutral varieties of strawberries grown inside the high tunnel. Now, day-neutral is, uh, is a little bit different than what our normal uh, strawberry grower in the backyard would grow. Correct. Right? So what that means, day-neutral varieties are new. They're typically coming out of California and mm -hmm. Florida breeding programs. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to traditional strawberries that need the days to get shorter and then longer in order to start flowering, mm -hmm. they will actually immediately start flowering once they're planted. So, for example, this tunnel was planted on April 17th, and we were harvesting fruit by the end of May. This year? This year, correct. Wow, yeah. wow, okay. So how long will they, how long will these strawberries live under this high tunnel? So strawberries are perennial plants, so they would live as long as we allow them to, mm -hmm. but this is an annual system, so we will rip them out about the middle of October, pretty much once we get tired of picking strawberries, because <laughs> at some point the grad students don't like that so much. <laughs> okay, continue, <laughs> continue what we have here. So basically what you're looking at is a variety trial grown under the, under the high tunnel. We have six varieties of day neutral berries. Mm -hmm. uh, now one of our big questions when we put this experiment together was one, what varieties would do the best, mm -hmm. but also what's going to be able to survive the heat that we have here in Kansas. So we're using shade cloth under the high tunnel and then we're also implementing this system called evaporative cooling where we actually turn on the sprinklers on the strawberries for about five minutes at the heat of the day mm -hmm. and then when that water evaporates it takes that heat energy with it so it's a nice way to cool the plants down during the middle of the day now the big question we have is if we're doing that what's the effect going to have on the, the botrytis and other fungal molds right. and fruit rots as well as fruit quality mm -hmm. so all of the fruit that gets harvested from this trial goes over to the k-state olathe campus where they do post-harvest studies looking at decay shelf life quality and nutritional quality as well too of course, there's differences in varieties as well. Absolutely. We're seeing lots of differences in varieties. We're also seeing some effects of the evaporative cooling system as well, too. Right. Uh, hold on to that thought about the evaporative cooling system. You know, m most producers, or most pr listeners here are, pr are producers, and they know corn variety performance tests and sorghum and soybean sure. and wheat variety performance tests. But we actually have, we actually have different varieties here, and you can kind of see that uh, some are faring much, much better uh, under these conditions as opposed to uh, as some of the other, like the one right behind you here, is not doing so well. So obviously that'll, that one will be chucked. Absolutely. At yeah. the end of, so how long, of a, uh, how long is this uh, study going to last? So this study is the second year of a two-year study. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the results we see, we may do it again next year, but right now it's part of our master's student thesis, and so she'll be wrapping up her thesis work this fall. Okay. Kerry, don't go away. <laughs> you folks at home, don't go away either. Grab your cup of coffee and come on back. We'll be here after you get back.
Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer. And what you're looking at is the top of a high tunnel. And we're still in this uh, strawberry, strawberry production high tunnel system here. And we got uh, uh, Carrie Rivard with us. And we were talking about strawberry production under this, under this system, under the high tunnel, and going well into the summer months. But, you know, not everybody wants to spend a whole bunch of money on these things. I mean, they'd have to be really serious strawberry producers. What about, what about uh, just somebody that has in the backyard or, or two or three acres that are trying to make some money off, off of it as well? So talk to us about strawberry production uh, not under the high tunnel. Sure, so we work with a lot of farmers here in the area that have U-Pick operations in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll typically plant strawberries in plastic culture raised beds. They're eight to nine inch tall beds. Okay. Uh, and those plastic beds are made with a machine that actually forms the bed and then the-, the Lays down the plastic. Lays well. down the drip tape and the plastic all mm -hmm. in one pass. Mm -hmm. Now in that system, they're typically planted around the 1st of September up until the 15th. Mm -hmm. And then they're harvested during the month of May. So it's okay. a great crop for a U-Pick grower because it's a nice way to bring those folks and early in the season before their peaches and their blackberries start to come on. What we're looking for with our research is uh, we're investigating this use of this annual plastic culture system. Mm -hmm. uh, strawberries are typically grown in, uh, or not typically, but historically have been grown in a perennial system mm -hmm. uh, where you use matted row and straw mulch during the winter time. Right, but right. in order for that to work, you have to keep those plants alive all summer. Mm -hmm. And that costs a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And it's also very difficult for the growers to be successful at. So with these annual plastic culture systems, we plant them in the fall and harvest them in the spring and clean out the field, put in a cover crop, and then restart the whole system so, okay, at so the when, of September. So uh, I interrupt you together again. Uh, May is when you, you pick them or have them Correct. picked, okay? Yep. Then when, when would you destroy them? So probably about the 1st to the 15th of June. Okay. Kind of depends on the season. It's right. real variable on how cool or warm our springs are. Okay, how do you, how do you kill them? Uh, herbicide or just, just tear them out? We actually just killage. go in with a flail mower uh -huh. and actually just mow them off right on top of the beds uh -huh. and then just till it back into the soil. Okay, yeah. uh, please continue, then how, what, proceed. Sir, sure. So the research that we're doing, because this uh, annual system is pretty new for the area, mm -hmm. we're trying to develop better ways to protect that crop during the winter. Okay. Uh, now here in the Midwest, if you're going to grow in an annual system, you want to actually cover those strawberries with what we call floating row cover during the winter, mm -hmm. which is basically a frost protection blanket. So we're doing research to determine the thickness and the application timing of that row cover in order to reduce the incidence of winter injury on those plants. Is that row cover, is it plastic then? So it's, it's, a, a, spun, it's a spun bonded polyethylene fabric. Okay. So it's, I'm it's, sure it's black. It's, no, it's white actually. Oh really? Yep. So what, so light uh, penetrates through it? It's, it's so that it penetrates through it, but also what we're finding with our research has been really interesting is that the white and also the thicker row cover reflects some of that sun back on warm days. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're trying to do with that work is keep those plants dormant all through the winter. Oh, I see. And okay. if, if we get a warm day in January or early February, it's going to warm up those beds and it's going to actually wake them up uh, right. preemptively and cause more winter injury. So we're actually finding with our research the thicker fabric is not only helpful because it helps keep those really cold temperatures off, but it helps moderate the temperature underneath the, okay. the row cover. Yeah, okay. I, I see the logic there. Okay. Don't go away. You folks at home, don't go away. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors.
The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroy, your host, and we have Dr. Kerry Rivard. Uh, he's our fruit and vegetable guy here at the K-State Olathe Horticulture Research and Extension Center. Kerry, we've been talking about strawberries, okay, uh, under high tents, high tunnels, excuse me. Uh, what exactly is a high tunnel and how is it used and is it for everybody and cost, that sort of thing? So. It's a great question. So high tunnels are basically unheated greenhouses. Um, now, if you ask an engineer, they're really not the exact same thing in that the wind loads and snow loads are a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not a stamped engineered plan like a greenhouse is. It's really a non-permanent structure. Okay, so it's not stationary. Correct. Okay. And for that purpose, it's not insured in the same way that a greenhouse is. But to the average Joe, if you look at one, it basically looks like a greenhouse has many of the same components. Uh, the big difference from a growing perspective is that in a high tunnel, we typically don't have a permanent heating and cooling system. Right. Uh, so they're heated by the sun and they're cooled by the wind, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we typically grow straight in the soil. We're not growing in soilless culture or hydroponics or anything or like that. Or benches. Right, we're actually growing directly in the soil underneath. So that's the big differences between a greenhouse and a high tunnel. Okay. Now there's a couple different types of high tunnels. There's what we call three season high tunnels and four season high tunnels. This is a three season high tunnel that we're in here. And the reason we call it that is because we actually have to take the poly off during the winter time because it can't hold a snow load. The structure of this high tunnel just literally can't hold the weight of a if heavy you were to have 10 a six to 12 inch, inch snow. It, it would collapse. Exactly. Okay. Uh, now our four season high tunnels are typically a lot more rigid. Uh, the roof is a bit more peaked and so they can shed some snow. Mm -hmm. um, and typically growers will plant cool season crops like spinach and lettuce and other things during the winter and be able to pull those crops out throughout pretty much the entire winter period. So one of the things that's happened in the last few years is through the program um, NRCS. promoted by NRCS, the EQIP program, there's actually a cost share for high tunnels. And so just in Kansas alone, there's been more than 400 high tunnels built in the last four years, uh, specifically for growers to grow fruit and vegetable crops and take them to market. So where is that located? I mean, all across the state? All or across the state, Okay, absolutely. Or more over in the northeast, uh, you know, around Olathe and you know, City the reality is local production follows local populations. So yeah. around here, Lawrence and Kansas City areas, there's lots and lots and lots of high tunnels. As we go out farther west, they're a little bit more sparse, but they're actually even more important out there because we have such bad issues with our wind and the heat, especially late in the summer. Uh, the high tunnels are a critical component to being able to produce fruit and vegetables in western Kansas especially. Okay. Now there's a, there's a question that you hear people talking about, this is away from high tunnel a bit, but uh, buying locals better. So uh, I'm sure you're, in the, you're under the camp that that's the case. Right, right, sure. No, well, I, I support local farmers here in the state of Kansas, and most of our growers here are not selling to a national market. They're selling at the local markets, mm -hmm. uh, especially around the larger cities like Wichita and Kansas City and Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And a high tunnel is a perfect, uh, gives you a little more flexibility Absolutely. other than just the May, June, July, so maybe what August. We, what we typically say for a high tunnel is that it's going to give you about 30 days of season extension both in the spring and in the fall. Uh, but here in Kansas, they actually do a lot more for just environmental protection and protecting from the storms and the hot wind and all those kinds of things throughout the course of the whole summer. Mm -hmm. um, and we find, that especially for high value crops like tomatoes and peppers, um, even in a year that's not bad for growing outdoors, the ones inside the high tunnels do a lot better. They're a lot more consistent. You get a lot higher marketability from the fruit. So basically overall produced. quality, uh, marketable quality is better. Exactly, okay. exactly. Okay. Don't go away. I've got some more questions for you. All right. You folks good. at home, now is your chance to get your cup of coffee and hurry on back. After these words from our sponsors, we'll get started again. Grain sorghum is one of the most important cereal crops worldwide, and Kansas leads the nation in its production. 
Over the years, sorghum has been either exported, used in animal feed domestically, or for other industrial uses. Recently, its use in the ethanol market has seen tremendous growth, with 30% of domestic sorghum typically going to ethanol production. Kansas Grain Sorghum is committed to sorghum research, market development, and education. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.org. This is Eric Stone Street, and as many of you know, I love my home state of Kansas. In March, Kansas ranchers lost homes, equipment, and thousands of cattle from the largest wildfires in the state's history. Imagine losing all you have in a fire. Not just your house, but your livelihood. Ranchers are beginning to rebuild, but it will take years and tens of millions of dollars to build back herds, fences, and other infrastructure. Today, I'm asking you to help. Donate what you can and show your support to the ranchers of Kansas. Simply go to kansasfires.com your donation is tax deductible and will go to those who need it the most. There's um, a lot of different ways of doing this woodwork, but I could not make a knife without both hands, especially without this thumb. And I had my thumb was so sore that I couldn't even touch it, and they wanted to fuse it, and I said no, cut it off because I didn't want it sticking up. And I found out about the Kansas Regenerative stem cell and went to Manhattan and had that taken care of in my thumb, and now I'm able to go again. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. I see you've got that cup of coffee in your hand. Welcome back to That's My Farm. We're here at the K-State Olathe Horticultural Research and Extension Center. And with us, Kerry uh, Rivard. And Kerry, we talked about high tunnel uh, production. What else? Do, what other studies do you have? I see you have blueberries here, and blueberries in Kansas is kind of a odd thing. So, but what else do you have going on? So we're doing a lot of work, um, really trying to help our growers that are that are using high tunnels to produce their crops. Um, one of the things we do a lot of focus on is with uh, tomatoes mm -hmm. and specifically grafting of tomatoes. So we actually graft a tomato onto basically a wild relative of the tomato in, in order to increase the yield and also uh, reduce the incidence of soilborne disease pressure. One of the things that can be That's challenging really in, a, in a high tunnel is um, because you're not able to rotate as much, oftentimes soilborne diseases can be a problem. Um, so we're doing a lot of work there looking at different root stocks um, that perform well for tomatoes. Uh, we also have a lot of variety trial testing in high tunnels. We're currently testing 10 varieties of peppers as well as tomatoes, and we publish that through the Midwest Vegetable Variety Trial Report that comes out of Purdue University. Uh, and then, of course, we've already talked a little bit about our strawberry work, looking at different day-neutral varieties to, to grow in the high tunnel. Uh, and then we're also doing some interesting work looking at soil microbial communities within the high tunnels as well, uh, trying to determine how the impact of the high tunnel system actually affects the soil microbial biology. Well, logically speaking, or thinking that you, that could be different than, say, a, an outdoor an outdoor system. It's a very different environment. You know, keep in mind that it doesn't rain in a high tunnel, and particularly in a four season high tunnel. Mm -hmm. And so soil management is a critical importance in order to be proactive. We need to use cover crops and compost and things like that to make sure that we have good healthy soil underneath that high tunnel. Okay. Uh, you have some asparagus down here, but that's that's not under high tunnel. And you got some berries, uh, blackberries. There. Right, yeah. We also have some primocane fruiting blackberries. So these are actually blackberries developed from the University of Ar Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And unlike traditional blackberries which fruit on their second year of growth, these actually fruit on their first year of growth. So what's nice about that is <clears throat> obviously you can get a harvest a little bit quicker, um, but it also means that it's basically a late summer to fall producing berry as opposed to the floricane varieties which produce in the early summer. So we are working with a lot of growers that are basically doing mixtures of both floricane fruited and primocane fruiting. So they have production so they through they can, the whole season. Exactly, extend their season. Because, you know, it, it, 
other production is going to be, everybody else is producing at the same time, prices right. go down. So exactly. if you extend that season, you're going to get some higher prices, uh, in theory, later that, in the season. That's exactly right. And it just helps diversify and develop your market, too, because you can keep those people coming back for more goods. Okay. What else do you have? So we also do a lot of variety trials through the All America Selections program. Um, and we have a diversity of crops, hot peppers, melons, uh, butternut squash, all kinds of things that we involve in that variety trial program. And then we also have a big effort to um, look at soil quality and we're doing some work with no-till pumpkin production. So in, under no-till systems for pumpkins, we actually grow a cover crop up in the fall, we roll it down with a machine called a roller crimper, and then sure. we plant the pumpkins right through the residue. I'll be darned. So we're doing some work uh, looking at different cover crop mixtures as well as integrating spring-planted cover crops uh, for those pumpkin growers. Because the last thing you really want to do if you're a pumpkin farmer is go back out into the field on October 15th and try and clean everything up and plant cover crop in a period of a couple days. All right. Carrie, I really appreciate you, Thank you. taking time You're to welcome talk anytime. to us about the, the field here, the station here, and, and enjoyed the, uh, the diversity, basically. Okay. Good. Thanks for coming. Folks, thanks for being with us as well. And don't forget, next Friday, about this same time, we're going to have another issue of That's My Farm. See you then. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.